Let's pray. Our Father, we're back again. And I ask that the Spirit of God would take the Word of God and teach us some more truths. There's so much on this subject, Father. It's a huge subject. And we're just on the fat footers, really. And then building foundation on that. And you have given so much light to draw out uh, in these these principles in the New Testament that we really haven't even gone over and gone through. You've given us Ephesians 6 about the armor, powerful truths. And now we ask again that you would be glorified, that you would rebuke and bind any spirits hanging around here. Um, if there are any, I'll just invite all of you to go to the presence of Jesus Christ and go where he tells you to go. And Lord, just send them to the pit. We don't need them. All replace your spirits. We thank you that in Christ, we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies, and that you've given us verses like, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so in the name of Jesus, we lift up our families, our loved ones. Some of us have deep trials, rebellious young people, that the enemy has been given ground, and he's certainly taken advantage but Lord, we stand now for our families, our children, grandchildren, and, and just ask you to have mercy and rebuke the enemy away from them right now. You said we're two or three are gathered together, and we're quite a few more than that. And so, Father, we believe that right now, in the name of Jesus, the power of the Spirit of God is working to rebuke the enemy away and to turn the hearts of the rebels back to you. You know, we cry, some of us, Lord, we're bleeding, some of us, and we thank you now for the victory. Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Another thing from Ganal, January 3rd. Head and heart. He who has only a nodding acquaintance with the king may easily be persuaded to change his allegiance or will at least try to remain neutral in the face of treason. Some professing Christians have only a passing acquaintance with the gospel. They can hardly give an account of what they hope for or whom they hope in. And if they have some principles they talk, take kindly to, they're so unsettled that every wind blows them away like loose tiles from a housetop. When Satan buffets and temptation washes over you like a tidal wave, you must cling to God's truths. They are your shelter in every raging storm, but you must have them on hand, ready to use. Do not wait until it, is a sinking, until it is sinking to patch the boat. A feeble commitment has little hope of safety when caught in a tempest. While that flounders and drowns, holy determination grounded in the Lord will lift up its head like a rock in the midst of the highest waves. Supreme Scripture promises that people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel 11.32 An angel told Daniel which men would stand and be counted for God when tempted and per persecuted by Antiochus. Some would be taken in by the bribery of corrupt men. Others would fall victim to intimidation and threats. But a few who were firmly grounded in the attendance of their faith would do great things for God. That is to say, to flatteries they would be incorruptible, and to power and force unconquerable. Head knowledge of the things of Christ is not enough. This following Christ is primarily a matter of the heart. If your heart is not fixed in its purpose, your principles, as good as they may be, will hang loose and be of no more use in the heat of battle than an ill-strung bow. Half-hearted resolve will not venture much nor far for Christ. Well, we'll continue on. I hope you're not getting bored with all this. It's a little frustrating for me. I have this one little notebook, but I've got about a half a dozen, and the others have a lot more material in, in it than this. And I've been a little anxious to get over to some more stuff, but I felt like in praying God wanted me to go through the foundational work. Now we don't have to talk so much about old Boo, who he represents, so much we understand some of those things. Now we're going to see 
Uh, a lot of this was working behind the scenes. You can draw out a lot of these principles in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul really understood in the spiritual warfare. Job didn't go uh, focusing on the enemy. He was too busy with his friends, really. But uh, he was focused on God and, 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 uh, and himself and getting into more and more of self. The more he had to defend himself, which is a real trap of the enemy. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay and uh, if he'd just been quiet, which they did pretty good for the first seven days, <laughs> then they began to um, assume some things about Job that were not right. And God's assuming things about, or Job's assuming things about God that's not right. Well, I'm going to take off now on um, Jacob. And again, I'm glad you know a lot about this. I got a little confused on the wells. I think I repeated one. On some of my notes. The title of this one is uh, Lessons in the Life of Jacob. It's going to make a, a hard decision. I'm going to be back over around in Genesis uh, 25. We have uh, promises given 19 through 23. Um, <clears throat> which I will mention again, we've already talked about this. <clears throat> um, there's a battle going on in the womb of Rebekah. And the Bible says in um, 21, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord in was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said... If it be so, why is, am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now I'm assuming that uh, Isaac knew about that. Maybe he didn't. But I think uh, I, it was very clear to Isaac that the elder was to serve the younger. And so whenever we try to reverse God's order for things in our life, we have problems. And so here we go into um, <clears throat> the soup deal with Jacob. <clears throat> we know the story. Esau's a hunter and Jacob is uh, more of a domestic man. And uh, Isaac is hungry, so he calls in Esau. Uh, to make him some of the venison soup that he loves. Rebecca hears about it and says, uh-oh, <clears throat> Isaac's going to give Esau the blessing. Now God has already established that the elder shall serve the younger. This is not supposed to be. Now Esau had by right the birthright, and I'll talk about some of these things. And so we're going to get some principles on this. Jacob, I believe, was born to be a leader. He was born to be... He was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one of the, uh, the three that we call. You go over to Hebron, there's a grave there, and in there is Abraham, J Isaac, and Jacob. I've stood there and looked at those graves, the old green tapestries. You might have a hard time getting in there now. <clears throat> I think they've done some more buildings over it. But that was a long time ago, back in 1968. And so he was buried there. He was buried with Abraham and Isaac. And uh, God meant him to be a leader, and uh, he's going to go through a process to get there. And we're going to learn some principles. God wanted him to be a winner, to be an overcomer. And in Christ, that's what God wants us to be, First John chapter 5. And, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, here's some things. I'll just list some things here. Um, Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Uh, and the double portion of all uh, was to go with the birthright. Um, Esau was a low, profane fellow. He had no altars in his life that we know of. Hebrew twelve sixteen says he was profane. He was a profane person. Um, he had uh, no zeal for the Lord that we know of, no... Uh, um, 
desire or affinity to God that we can see. Uh, but in this birthright, there was the double portion, and there was the dignity that went to it, and the authority, the power, and uh, the spiritual heritage of the family. He was to become basically the priest over the family. And so God, uh, in his foresight, could see that wasn't going to work out what Esau, so he said Jacob needed to have it. And so we get into some interesting things in this. One of the reasons Jacob's life is important, because 40% of the book of Genesis covers his life. Forty percent of it covers his life. So the foundation of, of, uh, of the future and the rest of the Bible, 40% of, of Genesis, which is a very important book, there are some things here that we might need to learn. Um, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, I picked up this statement I, from Hudson Taylor. I don't know where he got it, but God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. So Jacob's going to give us some lessons and choices and making decisions, and he's going to get into some tight places here. Now, the birthright, this position of authority, uh, what's so special about it? Uh, it was nothing to Esau. He was just a, he was a rough, mountain-type guy. Uh, uh, and so the birthright was his. And Jacob's going to take it to him, but the blessing is something else that Isaac's going to give to him. So Jacob, I've understood that he really didn't have a right to take that birthright from him. He, uh, so he, deceived, he tricked him. He didn't really trick him. He just you know, made a financial deal with him, a fraudulent deal. Uh, but he's going to pay a high price for all the things he tries to get for himself. And not let God give him. God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. So he said, hey, this is a good deal. You know, I can get his birthright from him. He doesn't care about it anymore anyway. And, and then he's going to take the blessing away, which uh, <clears throat> Isaac was going to give to Esau. And he'd been told that he was not supposed to do that. So we got problems and we'll list these things as we go along. And he had uh, basically a 20-year uh, uh, vacation away from his brother. Now, a principle here. Carnal methods never achieve spiritual goals. Even though there are some things that, that needed to be done and be done right, it didn't necessarily give Jacob the right to do it. It's best let God do it. And many times it looks impossible. And like, uh, you know, Abraham and... Sarah, it doesn't look like we're going to have a child. i get, got plan B over here. Uh, plan Bs don't really do too good. And here's another principle. Even though he messes up so much, and this is good, grace is going to cover him. God's grace is going to cover him uh, until he makes it right with Esau 20 years later. And he gets down there with Laban. We're going to look at those things later on and has a lot of fun there with Laban. Uh, so moving into spiritual authority... Here's a principle, moving into spiritual authority without proper spiritual authority's blessing usually doesn't work. I've seen a lot of men, I've worked with a lot of pastors, uh, travel around the country, a lot of different places. I see a lot of times those that have established themselves up as an authority, it doesn't work. For one thing, they are to be qualified. And the Bible teaches that a man that's going to be in the position of eldership or whatever is to be proved. There's a reason for that. And so there's to be a submission to authority so authority can establish and recognize you in that area. And I'm not necessarily behind all the ways of man in doing that kind of stuff. But grace will cover him. And um, <clears throat> I've got another question. Maybe you can help me on some of this. Uh, did Rebecca talk to Isaac? before she decided to make her decision? Did she check with her husband? I would probably assume, maybe you too, nope. <laughs> She's going to do it herself. Another woman fixing a deal here. Oh, how many deals can we get into? Uh, two wrongs don't make a right. And so what we're going to actually see is wrong to wrong to wrong to wrong. Two wrongs just don't make a right. Just like years ago, I heard a pastor share a story. He was in the church. He was pastoring a large church. And he had a Chinese couple in there. And they had a baby. And uh, he's up there looking through the window at this baby. And the father's there. He's all lit up. We got this, 
this new little baby in the, and the pastor turns to Mr. Wong. He says, Mr. Wong, is your baby okay? Oh, yes, pastor. What, what's wrong? Well, look, he's sort of all uh, yellow. And Mr. Wong, he looked at the pastor. He said, Mr. Pastor, you ever heard of two Wongs making a white? <laughs> so our two wrongs are not going to make a right or a white. And so what we have many times is we have a wrong, then we do another wrong to try to fix the other wrong, and then we'll maybe have another wrong about it. So we're going to learn some things and uh, maybe pick up a key principle as we go along. Um, here's an interesting thing. Why didn't God reprove Jacob for his deception? Why didn't God reprove Isaac for his fixing to do what he was going to do? There's a principle here that uh, maybe we ought to go over to Jeremiah in chapter 2 and verse 19 and see that this works. Many times I believe God doesn't have to do anything because what we have did is going to be punishment enough <laughs> to what we've done. You ever get yourself in a jam? You know? Oh, Lord, how did I get into this? <laughs> Would you help me out? Would you help me out? I went into a church one time to help them out. I was only there eight months, but I went in there to help them out and... Uh, I got in there, and, and a guy there said, this is my dad's church. And uh, I said, oh, okay, I took that. And then somebody in the community, I met another man, that's so-and-so's church. Oh, I thought it was supposed to be the Lord's church. But we'll find out. <laughs> and sure enough, it was his church. And uh, I, I ended up getting thrown out. But this is the, this is the thing. What we do, and, and he had actually, the church had actually shut down, and I was asked to come in and help him out and, and stuff. And, and, uh, and so I, was, I said, Lord, I'm in trouble. How can you be the Lord of the church? And this guy uh, wants to control and do everything his way. It's got to be done his way. It's his way or the highway type of thing. And I'm trying to obey you, and he wants me to obey him, which doesn't work out too good. Would you show me the way out? And so I'd go to the deer stand out in the woods and I'd just pray and get prayed up and come in and preach and he'd sit there and just sort of jerk and stuff. And, and God was working. We saw souls getting saved, people were coming in. And uh, right, I mean, we had a lot of people one time. He'd just come up and said, would you just leave? <laughs> I said, well, sure. It's your church anyway. I don't know what happened after I left. They're still going. But God dealt with him. Because I left it to God. I didn't try to fight with him or whatever. And here's the principle. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Now what happened there? It happened a long time ago. And since then I've learned, I've, I've had to try to learn this lesson again. But my own self-will, my wickedness, shall correct me, and my backslidings will, will, shall reprove me. Know therefore, God is saying, see that it's an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. Now this is a serious thing with Israel, but we just talk about, uh, Lord, would you guide me? Would you give me direction or whatever? I, I hope it's what I want to do. Because really, if it's not what I want to do, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. You ever do that? Okay, if we're in the same boat, then we'll sink together here. So with the correction and the chastening and the instructing, the backsliding and, and going into apostasy and all this stuff comes from us trying to have it our way. Now, <clears throat> what I see in this is Isaac almost failed. He was going to give the blessing to the wrong guy. He almost failed. And uh, the scripture said, the elder shall serve the other. And I want you to look at um, 2733. Um, get back over to Genesis. And I want to show you something about Isaac. 2733, after he'd, um, if, if I've got it right here, 
In 32, let's do this. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn, Esau. And all of a sudden he realized he gave the blessing to Jacob. And what did he do? The scripture says, And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that had taken the venison and brought it to me? I'm taking that of trembling. Maybe you never even thought about this, but I'm taking it this it's a shuddering, it's a quaking from the Hebrew. Uh, it's used in 4228, their heart failed them. In Exodus 19:16, the same word is used. The people that were in the camp trembled. I mean, it just starts shaking. And I am just wondering if he all of a sudden realized that he almost made a big, bad mistake. Now, I may be just assuming that on him. But all of a sudden, maybe the light is coming on that he almost made a real big mistake against God. And basically after this time, I think for, I don't know, 50 years, Isaac just sort of goes off the scene. Uh, you don't hear much more about him until the death after he, they get Jacob sent off. So <clears throat> I just wonder if he realized that God was overruling in this situation. Uh, <clears throat> Here's a principle. Somebody said this, Neither Isaac's will, nor Esau's pleading, nor Rebekah's scheming, nor Jacob's deceiving could defeat the purpose of Jehovah. Man proposes, but God disposes. God is going to get it His way because it's the best way. So no matter how bad we mess up on something, we're going to suffer the consequences, but God's going to keep on moving ahead. And so he's going to work in this situation. This is actually what you could call a real family mess. You ever seen one of those? He said, yeah, I got one. <laughs> yeah. This is a real family mess, and we're going to see the grace of God working. So we're going to look at some lessons on this. It's maybe not really highly organized. Uh, but Esau, again, uh, in Hebrews 12, 16, 17, 15, um, he failed. He fell short. Um, maybe I ought to go back over that. Because of the testimony about him, we have a man that God has chosen to be a patriarch. And we have Esau, his brother, who could care less about anything spiritual. And so Hebrews 12, 15, again we come back to Esau, and uh, hey, he did sort of want that blessing, didn't he? Because then he goes to pleading with his dad to give, and so his dad does give him a blessing, but not the blessing. He was so low, he sold his birthright, and then he thought he's still going to get the blessing to be the over everything. And so here's it describes him in Hebrews 12, 15, and he's pleading and begging, and, uh, and the Word of God says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Esau failed of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And then 17, for you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, but found he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I didn't understand that for years until finally this was brought to light that Isaac would not repent and change his mind and give him the blessing. He wasn't interested in repenting. He was not a repenter. He was just a profane person, but he wanted his dad to turn that around. And I believe Isaac knew what he did was overruled by God, and he gave the blessing to the right man. And so he was profane. That's a word for wicked. That's a, that's a word for wicked. So choices, the choices. Now, Rebecca, she initiated Jacob's uh, deception and she said, what? If things don't work out, my wrong, your wrong that you do is going to be upon me. And it was upon her. But the deception that was there, I've often, this is one of the things I want to know when I get to heaven. 
I said, Lord, what would you have done? Because Isaac was fixing to give the blessing to the wrong guy. And if Rebecca would have stayed out of it, what would you have done? He said, I had it all figured out. Don't worry, it wasn't a problem. <laughs> I, I had a plan. And, uh, and so, so uh, Jacob's going to get sent away, this looking out there, and she's never going to see him again as far as I know. So hard choices. All right, choices. <clears throat> God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. Sometimes God has to uh, let us go through some hard things for us to understand that he is in control. I've read the life of Hudson Taylor two times. There's a thick book with fine print. I have to do it with a, micro, with a magnifying glass now, God's Man in China. And I read that a long time ago, and then I read it again. But there's a story about Hudson Taylor's life. One day he went out into, you know, his heart was to go out into the inner China. He wanted to move away from the coast and all that, but he wanted to get out there. So one time he went off on a trip. He took some of his servants with him, and he got way out there. And while he's way out there, his servants take all of the food and, and all the supplies, and he's just left with a little money. And they abandoned him. I forget how far away it was. It was a long ways. Farther than he could make it back with what money he had. And so he started and he come back at night. He said he would go sleep on the, on the um, idol temple steps and try to curl up and protect his money so he wouldn't be robbed. And he went like that for days and days. I can't remember how long it was until finally... He, he was tired, he ran out of money. And then he's getting tired, he's getting worried. He wasn't a strong man anyway. <clears throat> and then he ran out of money, and then he's, he's getting tired, and he's, he's, he gets to a river, and he sees a boat going down the river, and he's very, very weak. And so he runs and tries to catch that boat, and, and he doesn't catch it, and he just collapses and passes out. And he wakes up, some hours later, on another boat. Another boat had come by, and the captain had seen him and pulled over and got him up in the boat and then took off. And the captain of that ship found out where he was wanting to go. I think it was back to Shanghai. And he took him down the river, and he, uh, and he had a junction there, and he got off, and he paid another captain of another boat to take him to Shanghai and to take him all the way to his doorstep so when that ship got there that captain took him all the way to his door and left him there and Hudson Taylor learned this great lesson and that was this that God is the circumstance in life he is the one circumstance in life and that God could take care of him no matter what happened now, Jacob's fixing to go off on this journey. Maybe some of you are in a journey, you've gone on a journey, or you're fixing to go on a journey. But whatever you're in, and, and however you're walking with God, God's fixing to fix you. And if you've got a problem, or you've got something in your life that, uh, that you don't like, and you're trying to fix it, let me tell you, uh, God's fixing to fix you with the fix that you're in. But if you try to fix the fix that you're in with, he'll find another fix to fix you with. So let him have his way with you. Let him do what he wants to do. So God's going to fix this man, Jacob. And so uh, here we go. <clears throat> uh, Isaac went against God. Rebecca went against Isaac. Uh, he didn't like that. And Jacob uh, went against Esau. And Esau didn't want God's rule, the spiritual authority. All he wanted was soup and to get the blessing and just have his way. And so here's a principle, a lesson. Without proper submission to authority, you're not ready for service. Without proper submission to God and to, to where you're at, you're not ready. You're not ready for God to use you. And so Jacob is going to be, what do you say, ground to powder? Because <laughs> he's going to get off with another deceiver, Laban. <laughs> you know, it's like the, the kid that wants to leave home, and uh, so he runs off. 
and to get away from his mother who was just controlling him and trying to direct him right, and he's got a rebellious heart. And, and so uh, what's he do? He goes off and joins the military and has a drill sergeant just like his mother. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so God's going to fix you. He'll fix you at home, or he'll fix you out there. And so uh, you're not ready to serve the Lord and, um, until you... You've learned to be in submission to authority. And so what we see here a lot is behind the scene, underneath these ground, underneath these things, the enemy is always working to try to get us away from the will of God and the blessing of God and the purpose of God. And God's always counteracting. Now, <clears throat> um, Esau, he was a grief of mind to them. He just lived, he was just a rebel. He lived in rebellion. All right. <clears throat> Choices. Choices for the Christian begin at the cross. You'll, you'll always make wrong choices in your life until you come to Jesus Christ and you decide to surrender to him and let him be your savior and let him be your Lord. And so the cross is the pivot point in life. Um, <clears throat> take up your cross. Think about that. Jesus talking, uh, take up your cross and follow me and I'll make you fishers and men and stuff. What did the cross mean? I mean, what do you mean? Take up the cross. We see them butchering people on crosses. What are you talking about? Be crucified. He's talking to them about being crucified with him and following him. It's never going to be easy, but it's the road to blessing. Now, all four of these seem to choose things for themselves. They wanted to go their way. Isaac, what he wanted. Rebecca wanted what... What she wanted, she wanted him to get the blessing, which happened to be God's um, idea, but she's not doing it necessarily God's way. And Jacob, uh, you know, he knew this was wrong to save his father. And so Jacob was going to be, he's going to be brought to the cross. It's in the process. And uh, Jacob took advantage of Esau, and so what's going to happen when he gets with Laban? <laughs> Laban's going to take advantage of him. So what we sow, we reap. So if you want blessing, then, uh, then give blessing and uh, be in a position to be blessed. Um, <clears throat> so it will cost you more. Now here's a key principle. I'm going to hit a key one every now and then. It's going to cost you more to refuse the cross than it will for you to choose the cross as a Christian. The easy way is usually not to cross. But the cross is the path of blessing. It's the path of power. It's the path of walking with Christ. And, and so this is the principle that uh, we need to understand. Another thing here, <clears throat> we must maintain unity in the home. There is division in the home. We must maintain unity in the church. We must maintain uh, unity with God. This is a key spiritual principle. Because the enemy is always working to try to get his way. He doesn't want this Messiah to make it to the throne. And so the battle all the way goes back to Genesis again, where we're, we were told that a Messiah would come. And he would deal with the enemy. So, <clears throat> this is sort of setting it up. <clears throat> to where we're going. Have you ever made a real bad mistake? Have you? I mean, something you wished you could do over again. Now, <clears throat> Jacob, you know, this is a bad one, and he got through it. It just cost him a lot, and there are a lot of things. But coming to the cross is, is not easy because it deals with our self-will. I'm going to share with you one of my worst ones that uh, I regretted a thousand times. Um, and I was just young. I'd just only been a Christian about two years, and I was just growing. I'm, um, I'm just coming back from, um, from being overseas. I was just 20 years old when I went over there. I'm coming back at 22 years old. I've already been in 15 countries, and and, uh, and, we, and I stopped off in Rome. I wanted to see Rome for a few days. And when we left the airport, now I'd done quite a bit of flying. I was in the Air Force. I could go hop on a plane and go anywhere I wanted if I had to leave and, the, and, uh, and they had room. 
And uh, they did something with this plane that you're not supposed to do. And uh, they packed that thing full of people. And they had all their bread and their sausage and all their relatives and everything. This thing was like a family reunion in there. And we're going down the runway. 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 And I've already flown a lot. And I'm thinking, um, Lord, <laughs> I think we should have been in the air by now. And we're going down the runway. And we're going down the runway. And I'm thinking, this is not really looking too good. But finally, they get the thing off the ground. It was way overloaded. And so, uh, as a consequence, we get out over the Atlantic Ocean and the pilots see up there getting something figured out that uh, they're not going to make it. <laughs> now, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> and so, what they did is they decided the first time they could come in sight of land, <laughs> they better stop and get some fuel. So, they stopped way up there in Newfoundland, I think it was St. John's or someplace up there, and picked up some more fuel so they could make it on to JFK. So, I would have never guessed God was in on this deal. I would have said then, that was not a good thing to do. <laughs> but we got to JFK, and uh, we're late. Now, I was supposed to meet an uncle there in the airport. And uh, this uncle, I was his favorite nephew, and he was my favorite uncle. And he was the type of uncle that was just a cool uncle. He was really, everybody liked him. We called, they called him, he had a nickname of Uncle Bunny. Uh, Bunny was his, because he was so fast as a kid, so they called him Bunny, and he grew up with that. So we all called him Uncle Bunny. And uh, he was an executive with Exxon Oil Company. He was up there, he'd been a painter, and he'd worked his way up to where he could inspect ships and things like that. And so we had a deal we would meet at the airport. And um, so when I got there and got to the airport, I'm late, and it took a long time to get on the shuttle. And finally, when I got there, we only had five minutes. Five minutes. And they're already on the second call. And we talked a few minutes, and then they get the third, the final call. And then he said, why don't you, Donnie, why don't you just stay overnight with me and catch a plane tomorrow? And I'm thinking... Okay, I've been gone for almost a year and a half. Mom and Dad are driving up to Shreveport uh, to get me. And, uh, and I made a decision. I said, no, I think I'll just go ahead and go. And I went and got on the plane. I didn't know that God was in that deal of packing that plane full of Italians. I didn't know that God had did all the delaying to get me to stay there with Him because he needed to be saved, and if anybody could reach him for Christ, I could. I blew it. I went on my way. It was, I was not probably mature enough to read and understand and to be having a submissive spirit and a surrendering spirit. And so the, that was in 1968, um, whenever it was July when I came back, or whatever. Several years later, he was driving home from work. He'd been drinking. He hit a bridge abutment. You know, he hit the rail or whatever. And uh, split both these juggler veins in his head. They put him in the surgery. They flew a surgeon in from California to do the surgery. Nobody in history had ever lived through this type of surgery. They operated 13 hours on one side and 12 hours on the other side to sew him back up. They had medical students all over the thing watching this thing. And he lived. He lived. And after that, he got saved. And I knew that I had blown it. That God had orchestrated that in my life for me to be used to reach him. And he got saved, and he'd just break my heart. He'd say, Don, I pray for you every day. I pray for you. But it, his memory was damaged. And so he was crippled for the rest of his life with his mind because he couldn't remember uh, short-term stuff. I think I got that now. <laughs> but anyway, I said, oh, God, if I could have that moment over again, what's an extra 24 hours? 
compared to a year and a half. Self-will. Go to the cross and die. Just go to the cross and die. Now let's talk about uh, his encounter with God in Genesis. He's going to leave home now. We know all this, all this story. In chapter 28, Isaac calls Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Benan. There again, Rebecca said, there's friction in the home. Esau's going to kill this kid. Let's get him out of here. And so, arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, verse 2, thy mother's father, and take a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother, and God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and go and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave to Abraham, and Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram and to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. Then we go into Esau, and he saw that. He goes on, and uh, he saw, actually in 7, he says that he saw when Jacob obeyed his father, his mother was gone up to Padanaram, then Esau, seeing that the, the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had and so he's just a rebellion. But Jacob is off. And now he's going he's to have a meeting with God. He's going to come to this place in verse 10. <clears throat> and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillars. And I've titled this section Pillars for Pillars. It's not the title of the message for you guys that do the title. You can get me afterwards. And it, anyway, he's going to sleep there. And he had a dream in 12. He dreamed, behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top, and it reached uh, to the heaven. Behold, the angel of God ascending and descending. In 13, he said, and behold, the Lord. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. Now, what would you have done if you'd been God? And you showed up, and there's Jacob. I said, hey, listen, you old rascal. <laughs> you deceiver. Uh-uh. God's not like us. <laughs> he knows that Jacob's going to get his own whipping from, the, from his deceiving. He's going to be deceived with Laban. But here he is. He's saying, Jacob, I love you. I have a plan for your life. Let, I, I want to be your God. And, uh, and all these things, it's just an amazing in this dream. Yeah. 13, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And, thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And then he says, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again unto this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob arose up from early in the morning, early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. And a lot of things happened at Bethel, the house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I surely will give the tenth unto thee. Now let's see if we can get some lessons that we read this. He sent out. No man's ready to be in authority until he's learned to be under authority. And so he's going to learn some lessons of being an authority. And here's the principle. 
We mentioned this a while ago. What God can't get done to us at home, he'll get done out there where we go. So you young people, it's best to learn your lessons at home. Because it's going to be a lot harder out there. So, so he's going to end up and get a wife or two. And he's going to have a lot of interesting things happen in his life. And he will learn some lessons from Laban. Uh, Jacob the deceiver is, uh, is now Jacob the wanderer. But God's in the process of bringing him to be Jacob the worshiper. And isn't that how he ended up his life? You go all the way to the end of Genesis. I, I looked up a verse. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't see it here. I guess I marked it down later on. I think it was at the point where, where uh, he saw Joseph's sons. And then it said he worshipped. He, he was a worshiper. But it took a while. So he's really running and he's really fleeing from the face of Esau. Um, <clears throat> and so he had his mom scheming and everything. Now, Jacob is a type of the believer. He's a type of us, in the sense, that uh, uh, <clears throat> of his life. God's going to make a, something out of him. He's going to build Christ in his life. Abraham reflected uh, God's sovereignty in his life, and Isaac, uh, his sonship, and uh, his submission, but he had some issues. But Jacob is going to be a demonstration of God's grace overcoming his life. And so, <clears throat> um, he's got Isaac's blessing. He's gone. He's meeting with the Lord now. And um, <clears throat> the order of things, uh, natural, is not always right. The working in the family, things just worked out there. Uh, but God's going to work all things after the counsel of, of his purpose. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to throw out something to you. Back in the back of my Bible, I haven't read all these things um, that I've learned in traveling around. Every church is somebody's kingdom, someone's kingdom. Put it on the altar. Everything you have should be held like that because whatever we want to close our hands in on will become an idol. So if God wants to take it away, take away an Isaac or something, we need to hold it like that. Christ is to be preempted in the church. You need to have qualified leadership. The foundation must be right. I've talked about some of these things. One of the things that we don't understand is when Jesus gave, set us off, he said to make disciples. Our school system, most of them are programmed backwards from what the scriptures say. They would say, go fill up your churches with people, numbers. And by the way, when I would travel around, I'd hop off a plane, I'd drive into town, I'd meet with these pastors, I'd, I'd begin to pick up this pattern, I'd get these two questions. They would say, how big is your church? Zero. <laughs> I don't have a church. It's the Lord's church. <laughs> you know? And uh, what school did you go to? And, um, and so the program is for nickels and noses, basically. And so you're measured successful if you've got lots of noses and bringing in a bunch of nickels and whatever. Uh, it's, nobody ever asks, how many disciples are you making? That's what the Lord wants us to make disciples. And so we get off track. Um, everything we do is to be out of prayer. What do we do? We have a meeting. God bless our meeting. We say, okay, do all we want to do this. Okay, God bless our plans. Instead of going before God and waiting in prayer and being sensitive to what He wants. These are just some things. And here's another principle that when God's going to build in your life, and that's what He's doing with Jacob here, many times when He's going to build, He's going to first tear down all the stuff that we've done. And that sometimes gets us a little excited, <laughs> you know, when he's going to, oh, God, you know, spend a lot of time conniving and politicking and advertising and trying to build up, and you want to tear it all down. By the way, <clears throat> we were going through some kind of big battle. I know you never know anything about this in our church years ago, <clears throat> and uh, it was getting to be quite a mess, and uh, I had done something wrong, spiritually wrong, and allowed the enemy to come in, and he's come in, and, and so uh, it turned out to be a big, bad deal. And I'm crying before the Lord, oh Lord, you see this mess we got, we've got this fight and everything, and, and, and a bunch of people left, and, and whatever, they tried to throw me out, and I'm too stubborn to leave, that you told me to stay, and whatever, but God, what's going on? 
And he said, I did it. You mean you're destroying this church? He said, yeah, I let the devil in. <laughs> of course, you opened the door. <laughs> and I, so I told him to go in there. And I said, why? And he said, because I was not getting the glory anymore. So whatever is in our life that God doesn't get the glory is going to be ground for the enemy to come in. He's going to let him come in. Um, <clears throat> old wine bottles. You can't put the new teaching of the crucified life and the cross into these old systems. It doesn't work. I tried it two times. And after the second time, the Lord said, how many times i got to tell you, you can't put the spiritual truths of the cross and the crucified life and the powerful spiritual life into these old systems. They're programmed by the enemy for destruction. And it just don't work. <clears throat> and uh, so these type of things. Give honor where honor is due. Always honor the Holy Spirit. Uh, what a man can't control, he will destroy. And if he does get control, he's going to destroy it anyway. To be one accord. Oh, church discipline, which is a hard one. I've messed up on that one pretty bad. Um, and different things. Uh, but here's one of them that we have to have. We have to secure God's blessing. And I mentioned this before. We have to. There have been many times when God was working, and our church got to the point one time where we had one family a month growing in and coming in, and they were coming around the country because they heard that God's blessing was there. We'd walk away, people walk away. Wow, God was here today. That's a rare thing. It's a rare thing. It's not easy to maintain. But it's something the Lord, because I've been in these churches, I'd see this stuff going on here, and, and I'd say, wow, God's blessing is not here, and, and these different things. So, here's this man, Jacob. Let me get back. Bunny trails. Sometimes I get this whole hound dog and get so far from the house, you have to come back around to get back. Okay. Um, make sure you have God's blessing. Um, Isaac lived about another 50 years without anything from him except his death in 3529. Uh, and I just wondered, did this affect his future? You know, we just didn't hear anything from him anymore. And so we have a seeming family tragedy. We have division, uh, diver di diversion of the blessing, deceit, dishonor, insubordination to authority, bitterness, anger, disunity, scheming. Um, you don't live in a family like that, do you? <laughs> But here we go, and he's gone, and now he's met the Lord, and what God is going to do is transfer the patriarchal blessing onto his life, but he's got to be in a position to be mature enough and strong enough to carry that. And as he gets on later in life, he gets that. Let's think about his sons, the 12 sons, and what they did to Joseph and all this stuff, and, and the things he went through. Okay, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Secure God's blessing. I'm going to skip this story here. I need to keep moving. Um, let me skip that. Meeting God at Bethel. Let's just talk about this a little bit. Meeting God at Bethel. You need a Bethel. At Bethel, God is preparing Jacob for leadership. And there are four of what I called uh, pillars. Uh, for, uh, for being in authority, for being a leader. And the guys are talking about my, my southern drawl. I mean, I've been gone a long time. I don't think I have much of it anymore. And I told him my teacher, Abe Pinner, <coughs> came from Canada, if you'd happen to know him, uh, in Bible college, you see, he would put me in a corner. My enunciation is still not too good. Uh, a lot of my... Um, my these would be D, D, for the, and stuff like that. And so uh, he's trying to build into me to speak right. God is going to build into Jacob for him to have these four things in his life that he needs. And so sometimes God has to put us in the corner and make us give our speeches there, back us off somewhere. Now, <clears throat> he's, he's fleeing, he's leaving, and he's come to Luz, and he's come to the place Bethel. This is the house of God. And here's the principle. For God to work deep into your life, 
God has to bring you to the place where He separates you from your past. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for it. Okay, so the past is all messed up. <laughs> Let's start over. And so he's getting a new start. And so he's a, he has a call to separate from his past. And this is what God did back there in 28. God, God you know, it's time to leave back there. It's a mess anyway. You're going to get yourself killed. Unless I intervene with Esau, he's hot. And so the latter it represents a type of Christ. Grace extending down to him. Grace pouring out unto his life. And he has this ream. It's the first revelation of seven revelations that he gets from God. And uh, uh, here's another principle in this thing that God is teaching in his life. God always initiates to man for a spiritual relationship with the man. There's none that's good. There's none that seeketh after God. So God is going to initiate it. And God is doing the initiating in his life. And God is coming into your life. He's reaching out. He's reaching down. All the time. Because he wants you with him for all eternity to fellowship. He has, he has things to show you. You know, he's, he wants an intimate relationship. He wants you to walk with him. Like Enoch. You know, walked with God, and he was not. God, I said, why, God, would you want to walk with me? He's God. He loves you. And he loves Jacob. And so God always initiates to man for a spiritual relationship. And he's given him the confirmation of the promise that was given to his father Abraham. And um, 14, that verse 14 in thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in thee in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. All of this thing, I have a note here, they spring out of the desire of God to bless Jacob. Look at all the things that are going to be his that comes from God's heart to him. Ask God to open up your understanding of what he has for you. Don't live, live a, a, mutine, a, a boring life or whatever. You know, I have a little message that, that I give sometimes. I gave it New Year's, I think, on the seven levels of life. And the last level, the ultimate level, is a level of adventure. Now, walking with God, I've got to tell you, it can be a little bit more exciting than you want sometimes. It can give you some things. But this brings out of the desire of God for Jacob, that he might be a blessing. In other words, we have to be blessed by God, have an encounter with God, and get close to God so that we can be a blessing. He's got to just basically knock the stuffing out of us many times to get us to that point. And so, um, <clears throat> here's the first pillar. In verse 15, the strength, the thing that he's going to need in his life is God's presence. And he says... In 15, I am with thee and will keep thee. Jacob, you need to know that I am going to be with you. And you need to get this in your mind, get this in your heart, that if you're a Christian, God is with you. He is with you. His presence is with you. And this is the desire of God for us. He, this is his desire for Jacob to understand. He's communicating. Now listen, Jacob has left the influence of his father Isaac. For 20 years, and we don't know how much encounter he had with him after he came back 20 years later. There's just not much written there. But now God is going to move into the place of being his father. I don't know if any of you are orphans, but that's a hard, hard thing to grow up as an orphan. So God moves in there to be your parent himself. So this is God's desire. <clears throat> Another lesson in this thing of God's presence is uh, not only has he lost his, uh, his earthly father's influence, but he has stepped into the realm. There's a, there's, a, there's a verse in John 14, I think it is. The Father himself loveth you. He's moving right into the realm of God the Father's love and protection. Many times he might think, boy, God, if you're loving me, look what Laban's doing to me. And if he could speak back, he would say, yes, I see what he's doing, but you need that. 
We've got to get this old Jacob out of you because I'm working on a new Jacob to come out of you. I'm looking. The old Jacob is just nothing but schemes and, and everything. But the new Jacob, who's not going to be Jacob, he's going to be Christ to come out of your life. The old Jacob, he doesn't generate blessing. But the new Christ coming out of him is going to produce blessing. Um, so that first pillar there, this desire of God to, to be his father. Here's another thing I wrote down. <clears throat> Most all the great moments men and women have had in the presence of God has been when they were alone with God. And Jacob is alone with God. The devil wants to keep you busy. I remember when I was a teenager, I'm, I'm listening to the radio, kids, they got noise going all the time and whatever. They can't stand to be still and be quiet. Why? <laughs> we begin to hear things, we begin to think, and, and the devil wants to keep you distracted and busy and everything. But if you get along with God, be still, you can hear him speak. I, I used to love to go out in the woods and hunt. I lived in town, lived out on the edge of town, but we were in town in the subdivision uh, when I grew up. So Friday come, I'd love to just get out in the woods. I didn't, we would squirrel hunt down there. I don't know why anybody would want to eat a squirrel. Do you? Any of you ever eat a squirrel? Man, they're tough. <laughs> They'd make a gumbo out of it. I mean, it was food, I guess. <laughs> but you cook it right, you could get it edible. But uh, I wouldn't get many, but I would enjoy being quiet. It's almost like there was a peace there. And, then, and, then, and so God wants to get, get us away. And so Jacob is there. Um, <clears throat> Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of God and said two things to him. In 13, he said, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord thy God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou Lias to thee will I give it into thy seed. Um, there are a couple of things here that I get from the value of him being in the presence of God. One is for the first time in his life he can hear. I believe he's hearing God. We don't have any record really before that. But he can hear. He can hear. And then also he can worship. Because what's he do? In, in 18 and also 22 he's going to give a tenth no man's going to give a tenth unless really he's a worshiper of God. And actually, if he's a worshiper of God, he'll go beyond that most all the time. But he's going to be a worshiper. Now, here's the second pillar, the presence of God, the next pillar, the thing that God's going to build into him for him to be a father, a spiritual leader. He needs to understand the idea of protection. What God said to Abraham, I am thy shield. I am the shield. We take the shield. We've got the shield. Jesus is our shield. And so he says in 15, and we'll keep thee. He said basically what that means in the Hebrew, he's going to hedge him about. I'm going to be a hedge. It's the guard. It's the same thing that God told uh, Adam in the garden when he said to dress it. That meant to keep it, to guard it. He said, I'm going to be your guard. And not only that, in all places, all places that he goes. In 15, I am thy shield, the Abraham, the protector. So he's passing this on. Um, there's a booklet that I have that talks about 11 things to teach our children. And uh, the first one is your children must understand that as long as they are under your authority, they are protected. Which is a tough one for kids to understand. To move out from under protection of their parents, you move under the protection of Satan. And he doesn't protect too good. Here's the third pillar. <clears throat> And that's this, verse 15, preservation. He's going to preserve him. That doesn't mean he's going to be pickled and put in a jar like that. But he's going to be preserved. By the way, one of the things we've been looking at and studying about, less, we need to, you need to pray this, that God would keep you from evil. We did a study with our men last uh, Tuesday night when we met and prayed and we just went through the verses on the evil, how much evil there is and, and how, like Jabez's prayer. One of the things he said, that God would keep him from evil. You need to pray for that. Pray that for your church. Pray that for your children. And God said, you know, he's going to preserve him. And so, and, and he'll bring him again. 
that was encouraging, so he wouldn't want to spend all his whole life with Laban. And then the fourth pillar that God is going to build into his life is a promise. In 15, he said, I will not leave thee. That means to loosen, to relinquish. Uh, and when he gets to wrestling over here, he won't let him go. And uh, not only that, when we get to that, <laughs> Jacob's wrestling him. And, uh, and, and the Lord, I believe it's the Lord Jesus and pre-incarnate wrestling with him. And uh, Jacob said, let me go. <clears throat> and, uh, and then all of a sudden it turns around and then the Lord's saying, you let me go. And this is what the Lord wanted to do. He wanted to bring him around to where he would want God's blessing on his life. And we'll get there, some neat things there. But he said, I will not leave thee. Just will not leave thee. You know, for Jesus to leave me, he has to break his word. I will not leave you comfortless. We've got these things. He's got it. Wow, that is a promise. And we live by the promises. Okay, <clears throat> here's Jacob's response. Um, Going into this, uh, in 16, he finds that uh, heaven is closer than, than he thinks. And uh, 17, he has some reverence come into his life. Um, fears a natural response in the presence of God. Um, <clears throat> you know, Revelation 117, John said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And 18, he's, he's going to make his first altar Look at that. He rose up early in the morning, took the stone, and he has his first offspring. So God is drawing him in to be a worshiper. And so when you first meet God and he covenants with you, and, and uh, you always remember your encounters with God. And so your first baptism when you're baptized or your first communion and he pours oil, this is a dedicating of himself to God and the uh, offering of himself. Someone said, you, by faith you can pour your life out. You can pour your life out, uh, turn a pillow of softness into a pillar of strength or something like that. Uh, he makes his first vow in verse 20. Vow in Scripture, his, his first vow, I think maybe the first vow in Scripture. And this is Jacob's, um, maybe you say a conversion in his life or whatever, but he begins him in a life of grace. I've got these five things, six things written down. He is, this is grace coming down the ladder. Uh, it's descending. It's the grace of God. <clears throat> and here's Jacob. He's running. And uh, be grace sufficient versus his scheming. And so grace is going to be sufficient for him. He's in grace um, ruling over his life versus his deception. So God is moving into his life. Uh, grace uh, instructing versus his resisting and grace uh, long-suffering versus his impatience. He, he couldn't wait. Of course, his mom had talked to him. And so uh, Jacob, he starts off high, and God is going to bring him down low. He bring him down low. And uh, then grace trusting in verse 22 when you get down to the end. Here's a principle that I wrote down about this. If life is hard and dry... You can always go back to Bethel. He's going to have a hard life for 20 years. And what's he do? He comes back to Bethel later on. <clears throat> begin a life of learning to, as he begins a life of learning to be under authority by the grace of God. All right. Six o'clock, huh? I'm up to another section now. In your outline, it's called Divine Retribution. Um, I'm wondering if we should take a break right now, how long we've been going. All in favor of a break? All in favor, want to go another hour? <laughs> um, probably getting tired, are you? Let's just take a little break here. The next session starts at uh, 6. Maybe we could start a little early. Get going a little earlier, maybe. Let's bow for prayer. Um, Lord, we've been going for quite a while here, I think. And uh, I'm just going over some things. I'm trying to move through. And uh, we're going to get into some lessons, the hard lessons in his life. And... We're not really focusing in on the enemy and what he's doing. He's always there behind the scenes. 
We understand that from other scriptures and whatever. But here we see you moving into the life of a man. You're moving into Jacob's life. And Lord, I just wonder what you want to do with us through these meetings. Help us not to be satisfied with the status quo, but to reach out to you as you are always reaching out to you. Help us to grab a hold of promises and believe you for those promises in the battles and the wars that we have. As we mentioned, Father, some of us have some terrific battles. We're crying and we're weeping and we're groaning, especially some for uh, children. And so help us to grab a hold of some principles and truths that we can use. Now bless our break time here in Jesus' name. Amen.